Jonathan Dio is a money philosopher. He is a speaker. He is the host of the Mindful Money podcast. He is a partner with EP Wealth Advisors. He is an author, which I mentioned. His newest book, which is available now, is Mindful Investing, Right Focus, Better Outcomes, Greater Well-Being. Welcome back, Jonathan. Thanks, George. It's uh, exciting to see you again and to yeah. catch up. Great to have you back on. Refresh our memories. Tell us a little bit about your personal lives, more about your work, and what motivated you to put pen to paper for the new book? Well, uh, so there's a there's a lot that's happened in the last, uh, since we talked a few years ago. Um, and I, I don't think we actually touched on this before, but everything changed for me literally two years ago. Uh, my brother died. He drowned in the Pacific Ocean. You hear stories about, you know, the workaholic who goes to the doctor and you know, discovers a heart condition. Doc says, you got to slow down. You're going to die. New perspective um, starts to make some different choices. When Dave died, I had a pretty similar experience. You know, he died at the tail end of the pandemic. Um, things were starting to open back up. So my social circle had dwindled during the pandemic to my immediate family and him. To say we were close is an understatement. You know, he was my best friend in the world. He was the one person I spent time with outside my own family. Uh, and maybe my work colleagues, you know, through Zoom uh, for that two-year period. Uh, his death woke up for me uh, the need for friends. And I read articles before about, you know, how important it is, how friendships decline over time. And I, and I, and I know my situation is pretty normal, even if it's a little extreme. I had thousands of connections, hundreds of contacts, lots of associates, you know, couple friends and my brother. Uh, he was one of the two, right? And I was in the, it's never going to happen to me camp until it happened. And his death woke up with the need for friends, also woke up this need for meaningful work. And it's not just that the work needs to be meaningful, but the, the activities that I spend during my day, the things that I work on, everything's gotta be meaningful. So by the end of 2021, he died in June of 2021, I merged my firm into a larger practice. I gave up managing HR and managing technology platforms and, and tech stack and all that, and all those decisions that are business oriented. And I did two things. I pivoted towards time with clients and which I love. I love working with clients, working with individuals is great. And also on to financial education. So the, the book, you know, I wrote the first book in 2017. The second book is just one of the second one in a series of probably three or four that I'm going to work on. Um, that are all about financial education, financial literacy, helping people that don't have access. So by the end of 2022, I added a third thing. And this is part of my recovery following his death was, you know what, I'm going to be a mindfulness teacher as well. So I joined Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock in becoming a certified mindfulness instructor. Um, so the books and the writing, financial education is kind of the path and the mindfulness is kind of the method. Well, I'm so sorry about your brother. Thanks. And life is a really funny thing. I don't, my, my brother passed away at the beginning of 2020 and you and I are similar in so many ways, Jonathan. I, I think I did not know to, that, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and it sort of, it, it sparked similar things in, in me. So wow. you're, you're, you're explaining that and I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm just listening and I'm taking it in. You are a really smart, intelligent, and thoughtful person now, even more so thoughtful. Um, it's interesting. Like, I think I I was already, wasn't I already doing this stuff? Didn't I already know this stuff? But I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. You think, you think it's, I, I mean, like I said, you, you don't think it's going to happen to you. you. You know the things you're, you should do, but we don't do them. There's a gap between what we know and what we do. And, and, and then we learn, right? We learn. So that gap, that's not exclusive to you and I. That's a that's right. that, that that's a human feature and bug. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So how do it and is the the hope of the book when 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 somebody picks it up, what what are you hoping it 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 would that 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 people are gonna get from reading it? So I it's no surprise, and you know this, like it's no surprise, um, financial education is just lacking. Like people with resources hire people like you and I, other advisors, you know, CPAs, you know, to help them plan, stay on plan and educate their kids and all this kind of stuff. Um, but 95, maybe 98% of people just simply don't have access. They don't have the assets for people to manage. They don't have access to good advice. 
there's education out there, but almost all of it sells products. You go to a bank, you get something and it tells you, you know, there's my education platform. It tells you, okay, this is how you use our bank's, you know, uh, products. Most people end up doing it themselves. And unfortunately, the, the sort of the milieu that the stuff that people swim in, the, 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 the media, the, 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 the social media, it, it's always talking about and bringing us, bringing our focus on to things that we can't predict and can't control. So we end up trying to make decisions about things that don't help us. So the key to our education and coaching is we help people focus on the things that can actually make a difference in their financial outcomes. So I, I keep going back to, as an advisor, one-on-one -on -one with people, I get to make a lot of the decisions for people. They, that's what they want me to do. But for people that aren't sitting with people, they have to learn. They've got to educate themselves first. So the books and the writing and the blogs and the podcasts and your podcasts and other podcasts, this is how people learn. And we need to, we need to somehow get more of this learning out there so that people can bridge their own gaps between knowing and doing. I, I think I think that that's spot on. And I think it's a good thing that more people are talking about financial wellness, but a lot of it does fall fall flat. And I think right. that you really hit on some of those reasons. So knowing versus doing, I like to think about financial literacy, financial wellness, essentially, like I know about financial stuff, but a lot of people mm -hmm. don't. And so we need to understand what I know or what I don't know. And then how do I actually put that into practice? Right. That's, that's not easy to do in a book. So the point of the book is to, and, and I did kind of the same thing with the first book in terms of planning and how to make decisions about money, but in, investing isn't a complex thing. It's not rocket science. I say this all the time. Um, no advisor has any greater ability to pick better investments or time the market than any other advisor or than any other person. There's been a lot of I mean, there's been plenty of research on this. No one can guess the future. No one knows what the next big thing coming down the pipe is. Uh, and and there's article after article after article. I, I think uh, uh, Ritholtz put something out today or yesterday about how everyone got it wrong about 2023. And and the, the thing that bothers me about those kinds of articles is it, it, it suggests that everyone had it right in 2022 and everyone had it right in 2021. No mm -hmm. one ever gets it right. Like it, it's not something you can do. You cannot consistently predict or time markets. So what do you do? And in the, in the, uh, in mindful investing, I talk about just simple, simple, simple things that people can do. You have to save enough. You have to plan. You got to know what's important to you. You know, you, you, and then when you, in terms of investing, which is really the core of the book, it's, you keep it as simple as possible. And I and I tell people how I invest and I tell people how I suggest people do it when they do it themselves. And it's really, you know, pick a global equity thing. Don't pick 15 different things. Don't pick 30 different securities. Don't pick, keep it really simple and just add money to it when you can and ignore it, let it go. Um, Cause you can't predict, no one can predict. And, and this perceived complexity out there forces people to focus on things that don't add the value. And again, just, Take that complexity back, keep it simple, make fewer decisions, let it take up fewer mental cycles, and you end up with better outcomes and more joy. Well said. I think it is perceived um, complexity. I also sort of think it's engineered complexity, John. Oh, yeah, we could get into that for sure. <laughs> you know, but 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 regardless, the the point that I'm getting here, and I couldn't agree more with, is that you, investor, are perfectly capable of doing this. Yeah, totally. No, anyone can invest themselves. There's, you know, there are some special, how do you, how do you convert a, uh, an IRA to a Roth IRA? There's definitely some plant benefits with planning and there's estate planning stuff and there's tax planning. Stuff. There's all kinds of complexity, but 95% of people don't have that kind of complexity. They need to put money into an investment and let that investment grow. And that's the point of the book is help that 95% of people. I love it. And in terms of of actually writing the book, you 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 have been a writer. Is is writing something that you do every day? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so this goes back. This this story gets really tied up with uh, my brother Dave as well. So I I've had this before he died. I had this incredible morning routine. People talk about your morning routine sort of determines your day, determines your success, everything like this. So I had this incredible morning routine. I get up every day at 4.30. I would 
uh, meditate for 30 minutes. I would work out for, you know, an hour. I, and during my cool down, which, you know, for my body is like 90 minutes, I would read and write for 90 minutes. And I do it every day. And I did it every day for like 20 years. I did it forever. When Dave died, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So it all fell apart. And this is literally, we're two weeks now, two weeks ago, it kind of started to come back together. Um, the meditation started come back, coming back together like maybe four months ago, but the workouts sort of come back together and, and I, I'm starting to be healthy again. I've had some health stuff happen as well in the last, in the last year. Um, but it's, I'm turning this corner where I'm at 430. Let's face it. That's ridiculous. I'm not doing that ever again, <laughs> but, but, but 530 I could do And So I'm yeah. doing with 530. I'm just starting work a little bit later instead, you know, and some of those trade-offs I'm learning, maybe you don't work so hard, start a little bit later, do the same kind of routine, work out, meditate, cool off, read, write. So yeah, I've, I write every day. I can't help it. I have thoughts. I have to, you know, and because of the reading, I, it forces me to think about some things. So. Do you think that, I really think that, that, that writing makes me a better thinker and mm, for sure. that if I wasn't doing it, then I would be a worse thinker and I can't afford oh, I to do that, Jonathan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nor nor can I. But and if if you've done it for as long as I think we've both done it, you you can start to see. Like this morning, I had a I had a I had a client call, and he had this. Oh, there's this guy who's got this tax shenanigan thing that's happening, and I'm just like, just doesn't sound kosher to me. Doesn't sound like this is a realistic thing. So let me you know send me the documentation. I'm going to talk to a CPA and I know what I'm going to hear back. And oh no, this is not okay. Someone's selling him something. Right. And so it's, but having read a lot and having written and having thought a lot about finance, you just, you just have like a sixth sense about it at this point. You've seen it all. Like, you know, where the, where the nooks and crannies are. And so bringing that to light in my own writing and trying to help people make it really simple and not get caught in these kinds of things. That's kind of my, that's kind of my new thing. My, my brother and I, we're going to do this together. He was, a, he was set up to become my CEO in the company. Um, and he was going to start January of 2022. Uh, and he died in you know June of 21. So obviously he couldn't do that. And by the end of that year, I'd, I'd merged the firm, like I said, so I don't have to think about this kind of stuff, um, which means I had more time to do the thing that we were going to do together, which is sort of build these programs and build this stuff and write more. And that, I'm I'm just loving that part of it, writing more. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I think that that's awesome. And I'm also very much a creature of habit. And I spend a good amount of time thinking about habits and then the routines and I think that what we're all looking for is is sustainable success because mm -hmm. I can get up at four o'clock in the morning as well and you know do fifty things and this that and the other thing. But does that mean it's going to be sustainable or really serving me? And I think that that's something we're all. I don't know if we're all struggling with it, but we can all optimize that. Right, and I it it was. I mean, my wife. This is this goes back twenty five years before we were married, uh, she would get up at morning in the morning at like 3 a.m. And, and I'd be gone. And she'd be like, where did she text me? You know, back in the day when you had to had the single, you know, dot, 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 you had to hit the number three times on your on your flip phone to, to text somebody. She would text me and I'm like, yeah, I'm on the way to work. And it's just, I get up at the early and if I can't sleep, I get up and I go to work. And I've done that my entire life, like my default place. And this has changed since Dave died. My default place was, okay, I'm up, it's quiet. I'm going to, I'm going to go to work. Um, and back in the day, it was, that would mean get on the bus and, and bus down, you know, bus down the hill in San Francisco to downtown San Francisco. Now I just walk down the stairs. That's, you know, it's easier. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fascinating. So you talked about how you and Dave, Dave was going to become the CEO of, of, of your organization and you were going to work on these things together. And we talked about refocusing and reprioritizing and you had health issues as well. So yeah. are you honoring him through the work you're doing? How, how do you see that moving forward? Oh, there's no, there's no doubt. Um, and I, and I, I talk about this, you know, mid podcast episodes, you know, I, I do a podcast as well. And so um, there's a couple episodes I've recorded that are all about sort of how, how I'm doing, with my own recovery relative to Dave's death um, and, and, and how this is sort of bringing the things just a little bit of an aside in, in um, 
2004, he and I actually took out articles of incorporation in California for something we called workers financial. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was, um, it was uh, a company that was just going to be around education and coaching. And so we started thinking about this a long time ago. And then of course, 2004 is also the year my, my son is born. And then his son is born his, you know, my first child and his. And so we, you know, we, we bit up more than we could chew. We mothballed that. We come back to that at, you know, probably 10 years later. So this is six years ago. Uh, and we start building, we built the first course, worked with, um, you know, people on how to, how to market that more broadly and how to get that into, into more people's hands. And then, and then I started writing the first book and then, and then now we worked on, we worked on a little bit of some ideas for the second book and how do we, how do we reach more people? And so it's, it's been something we've always been, been going to do together. Um, my part is sort of the, the experience in the financial world. His part was how do we reach people through Facebook and how social media. So we wanted to have a broad impact. And so now today, the challenge for me is I, I still have the same ideas. I still have the same content and the same stuff, but I don't, I don't have the reach that I might've had. And so I'm having an impact and I, and I, and I love having an impact, but I'll never have the same impact, which just means I got to keep doing it longer to incorporate and honor and, and just have him be part of it. Um, the, the cool thing is, and the thing that's great for me is that, well, the dedication of the second book is to, is to his, his boys, uh, and, his youngest son, like randomly, this is probably a couple of months ago, said, Hey, my dad always said that you worked with investing. Let's, and he's 14, right? Can, can you tell me about what it means? And I'm like, I was just so stoked to have him ask the question because mm-hmm. it was, you know, I had a great conversation. My kids don't show as much interest in it because they see dad do it all the time, sure. but you know, he doesn't see it. So I, it honors his legacy from what we're going to do together. Uh, provides a, a, an avenue to support his family a little bit, which is something I really want to do. And really, you know, what much of the changes are all about is how do I, how to be a better uncle? How do I be a better brother-in-law? Um, because, you know, their lives changed a lot more than my life changed. Um, it hurt and it sucks and I hate it. And I would I, I trade anything to get him back, but it doesn't affect my day to day the same way it affects their day to day. Yeah. I appreciate that. I know you do. Well, Jonathan, I, 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 Congrats on the book. Uh, tell you. us where people can can get their copy of Mindful Investing, Right Focus, Better Outcomes, Better Greater Well-Being, and how people can engage and track you as well. Yeah. Uh, best place to go is to is www.mindful.money. Um, it's not .com. It's mindful.money. And we got a bunch of free resources there. I encourage people to take advantage of them. Um, the one that most people like the most is we have this course that's a free values, purpose, and goals course that helps people get started. Uh, once, you know, that's the first step anyone should have is sort of introspective. What, what's important to me? What do I want out of life? What do I value? Uh, and that's life gets built on top of those values, you know, goals get built on top of values. And so that's, that's usually the place people start. So that's where I'd go, go to mindful.money. Excellent. Well, if you enjoyed as much as I did, show Jonathan your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Check out the Mindful Money Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Go to mindful.money and check out all the great resources. Take advantage of that values, purpose, and goals course that Jonathan was talking about. And then pick up your copy of Mindful Investing um, wherever you buy your books. Thanks again, Jonathan. Thanks, George. And until next time, remember, Do your part by doing your best.